Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel US Defense. Before watching the video, please like, comment, and subscribe my channel. Enjoy video. The US Navy will deploy no single carrier killer weapon. It will deploy many. Here's what you need to know. Weaponeers are working at helter-skelter speed to remedy the U.S. Navy's range shortfall. Ah, yes, the carrier killer. China is forever touting the array of guided missiles its weaponeers have devised to pummel U.S. Navy nuclear-powered aircraft carriers CVN. Most prominent among them are its DF-21D and DF-26 anti-ship ballistic missiles ASBM, which the People's Liberation Army PLA has made a mainstay of China's anti-access-slash-area-denial-A2-slash-AD defenses. Beijing has made believers of important audiences, including the scribes who toil away at the Pentagon producing estimates of Chinese martial might. Indeed, the most recent annual report on Chinese military power states matter-of-factly that the PLA can now use DF-21D to attack ships, including aircraft carriers, more than 900 statute miles from China's shorelines. Scary. But the U.S. Navy has carrier killers of its own. Or, more accurately, it has ship killers of its own. What can disable or sink a flattop can make short work of lesser warships. An anti-ship weaponry is multiplying in numbers, range, and lethality as the Navy reawakens from its post-Cold War holiday from history. Whose carrier killer trumps whose will hinge in large part on where a sea fight takes place. That carrier killer imagery resonates with Western audiences comes as little surprise. It implies that Chinese rocketeers can send the pride of the U.S. Navy to the bottom from a distance, and sink U.S. efforts to succor Asian allies in the process. Worse, it implies that PLA commanders could pull off such a world historical feat without deigning to send ships to sea or warplanes into the central blue. Close the firing key on the ASBM launcher, and presto, it happens. Well, maybe. Why obsess over technical minutiae like firing range? For one thing, the 900-mile range cited for the DF-21D far exceeds the reach of carrier-based aircraft. A carrier task force, consequently, could take a heck of a beating just arriving on Asian battlegrounds. And the range mismatch could get worse. Unveiled at the PLA military parade through Beijing last fall, the DF-26 will reportedly sport a maximum firing range of 1,800 to 2,500 miles. If the technology pans out, PLA ballistic missiles could menace U.S. and allied warships plying the seas anywhere within Asia's second island chain. The upper figure for DF-26 range, moreover, would extend ASBM reach substantially beyond the island chain. From an Atlantic perspective, striking a ship east of Guam from coastal China is like smiting a ship cruising east of Greenland from a missile battery in downtown Washington, D.C., reaching Guam would become a hazardous prospect for task forces steaming westward from Hawaii or the American West Coast, while shipping based at Guam, Japan, or other Western Pacific outposts would live under the constant shadow of missile attack. Now, it's worth noting that the PLA has never tested the DF-21D over water, five-plus years after initially deploying it. Still less has the DF-26 undergone testing under battle conditions. That's cause to pause and reflect. As the immortal Murphy might counsel, technology not perfected in peacetime tends to disappoint its user in wartime. Still, an ASBM will be a useful piece of kit if Chinese engineers have made it work. The U.S. military boasts no counterpart to China's family of ASBM, nor is it likely to. The United States is bound by treaty not to develop mid-range ballistic missiles comparable to the DF-21D or DF-26. Even if Washington cancelled its treaty commitments today, it would take years if not decades for weapons engineers to design, test, and field a ship-killing ballistic missile from a cold start. Still, the U.S. Navy isn't without options in naval war. Far from it. How would American mariners would dispatch an enemy flattop in combat? The answer is the default answer we give in my department in Newport. It depends. It would depend, that is, on where the encounter took place. A fleet duel involving carriers would take a far different trajectory on the open sea remote from fire support from Fortress China, 
the PLA unsinkable aircraft carrier than if it unfolded within range of ASBM, cruise missiles, or aircraft in placed along seacoasts or offshore islands. The former would be a fleet-on-fleet -fleet affair. Whatever firepower each force totes to the scene of action decides the outcome, seamanship, tactical acumen, and Elon being equal. The latter would let PLA commanders hurl land-based weaponry into the fray. But at the same time, the U.S. Navy would probably fight alongside Allied navies from the likes of Japan, South Korea, or Australia in nearshore combat. And, like China, the Allies could harness Asia's congested offshore geography, using land-based armaments to augment their fleet's innate combat punch. In short, the two tactical arenas differ starkly from each other. The latter is Messier and more prone to chance, uncertainty, and the fog of war not to mention the daring do of an enterprising foe. Submarine warfare would constitute a common denominator in U.S. maritime strategy for oceanic and nearshore combat. Nuclear-powered attack submarines SSN such as U.S. Virginia or Los Angeles-class boats can raid surface shipping on the high seas or they can slip underneath A2-AD defenses to assault enemy vessels, including flattops, in their coastal redoubts. In short, SSN are workhorses in U.S. naval operations. That's why it's a grave mistake for Congress to let the size of the SSN fleet dwindle from 53 today to 41 in 2029. That's a 23% drop in the number of hulls at a time when China is bulking up its fleet of nuclear and conventionally propelled subs to as many as 78 by 2020 and Russia is rejuvenating its silent running sub force. American submarines, then, are carrier killers regardless of the tactical setting. Now, there's a bit of a futurist feel to talk about battling Chinese carrier groups. At present the PLA Navy has just one flattop, a refitted Soviet vessel dubbed Liaoning. That vessel is and will probably remain a training carrier, grooming aviators and ship crews for the operational carrier's most likely improved versions of Liaoning that are reportedly undergoing construction. In 2020 as today, the carrier air wing will remain the surface U.S. Navy's chief carrier killer. U.S. CVN can carry about 85 tactical aircraft. While estimates of the size of a future Chinese flattops air wing vary, let's take a high-end estimate of 50 fixed-wing planes and helicopters. And in all likelihood, the American complement will be superior to the Chinese on a warbird-for-warbird warbird basis. It appears future PLA Navy flattops will, like Liaoning, be outfitted with ski jumps on their bows to vault aircraft into the sky. That limits the weight and thus the load of fuel and weapons that a Chinese aircraft can haul, while still getting off the flight deck. USCVN, meanwhile, slingshot heavy-laden fighter-slash-attack jets off their flight decks using steam or electromagnetic catapults. More armaments translates into a heavier-hitting naval air force, more fuel into greater range and time on station. Weaponeers are working at helter-skelter speed to remedy the U.S. Navy's range shortfall. Boeing, the Harpoon's manufacturer, is doubling the bird's range. The Pentagon Strategic Capabilities Office recently repurposed the SM-6 surface-to-air missile for anti-ship missions, doubling or tripling the surface fleet's striking range against carrier or surface action groups. And on it goes. Last year the Navy tested an anti-ship variant of the Tomahawk cruise missile, reinventing a very very long-range capability that existed in the late Cold War. A new long-range anti-ship missile is undergoing development. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoy the video, see you on the next video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe and share this video. See you only at US Defense.